Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Crossings Online Service. My name is Andrew, and I am so glad you're joining with us. Now, we are in this series called Red Flags, where we are looking at all the warning signs in the relationships we have in the world out there. So, if you've ever been in a spot where you want to identify some of the warning labels that maybe should stick out to you a little bit more, I want to encourage you, jump in to the, this week's service with us. Now, in November of 2023, Forbes released an article that shook the business world. After some extensive research and interviews, Forbes found that 70% of Americans looking for a job, they lied on their resume. Now, one third of those admitted to lying frequently. And if that isn't bad enough, 80% admitted to lying in job interviews. Now, I don't know if you're tracking, but that is a lot of lying. And if you're wondering how it breaks down, 85% of people with a master's degree, they lie on resumes, and only 70% of people with no college education lie on resumes. So the moral of the story is, if you have a friend who constantly brags about education, odds are they're lying. And we've seen this over the last few years in our world, haven't we? A famous New York congressman was forced to resign recently due to lying on a resume. The Dodgers are investigating a story about a certain person associated with the team right now who apparently lied about attending UCI. Notre Dame a few years ago hired a coach and then fired him five days later because he lied on a resume. You see, what we are learning is there is a lot of dishonesty out there. There is a lot of manipulation and posturing out there. All of these stories remind me of a verse that's always stuck out to me. There is this old pastor in the Bible by the name of Paul, and he writes to a young guy new in ministry, and here's what he says. He says, the sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. Meaning that when it comes to some people, you meet them and within the first few minutes, they are wildly oversharing. They are telling you about all the craziness in their life and you are silently thinking to yourself, oh man, I just met this person. What's happening right now? I'm trapped. This person is so unhealthy and I can't get away. Has that ever happened to you? Where within the first few minutes of a conversation, you're like, oh man, how do I recommend this person to a counselor? But there is another group of people who present well, who seem like they have their lives all together. And the moment we trust them, the moment we allow them into our lives, they break our hearts. I'll tell you, as a pastor, too often I will sit down with someone who is getting out of a relationship where they thought, oh man, that person, I thought they were the one. They were everything I was looking for. This person was far and away the best thing that ever happened to me. But then fast forward a few months and they're telling me about how the relationship imploded, how it broke their heart. Or sometimes professionally, I'll sit down with someone and they will begin to lament this hire they made. And they'll say things like, oh man, on paper, this person was perfect. But from the moment we hired them, Andrew, everything went wrong. You see, today we are in week two of our series called Red Flags. And today I want to talk about how do we identify the red flags out there in our world, especially when it comes to relationships. Because if you think people lie on resumes, you better believe that lying increases when it comes to relationships. In fact, a recent survey found that 80% of people admitted to lying on dating apps. Now, who do you think tells more lies? Men on dating apps or women? I'll give you a moment, take a guess, especially if you're watching with someone. All right, well, the answer is men. Men are 7% more likely to lie, but either way you look at it, that is still a lot of lying. You see, men are more often to lie about how much money they make and about being service-oriented. Women, on the other hand, are more likely to lie about their weight and age. You see, the moral of the story is everybody lies. And with that, let's close our time in prayer. No, no, no. Today, I want to talk about, as we begin to see the red flags in the people around us, how, how do we see past the deception? How do we get to the heart of who people really are because you and I, we've all had an example, we've all had an experience of getting burned by being too trusting, too naive, too blind to the red flags that were often right in front of us. For example, 
Maybe you're dating a guy and he is kind and sweet, but you notice that every once in a while he gets so incredibly angry, like out of control angry. But because everything else is so great, you ignore it. You just tell yourself that, oh, he's just passionate. But down the road, this anger becomes a problem. It's intimidating. It's scary. It's a red flag. Or maybe you're dating a girl who struggles to say the words, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And you tell yourself it's not a big deal. But over time, what you see is someone who can't own their mistakes, someone who is always shifting blame to others, someone who struggles to take responsibility, someone who struggles to repair relationships. This is a red flag. Now, last week, if you were with us, we talked a lot about the red flags that are in here. What is going on in our own lives? And today, what we're going to look at is what are the red flags that are out there? The people we engage in relationships every day, we want to see what are the red flags we should be aware of today. And let me just say this. Sometimes in churches, people get really uncomfortable making these kinds of judgments about others. And they will even quote Jesus because Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged, which is a great verse. But let's unpack it for just a moment. You see, what Jesus is doing is Jesus is telling us not to put ourselves in the position of the judge of other people. And this is a good thing because we don't want to determine someone's guilt or innocence. We don't want to determine their worth. That's what a judge does. And we are not their judge. What we do is we want to enter into any relationship, any business relationship, any friendship or romantic relationship. We want to always enter in with our eyes open. In fact, the word we are going to talk about today is the word that doesn't get talked much about in our world anymore. It's the word discernment. Let me give you a quick example of this. There is an entire book of the Bible dedicated to wisdom and discernment. It's known as the book of Proverbs. It's a book where this great king of Israel, his name is Solomon. He writes to his son, and the entire book is to gain discernment, to gain wisdom. For example, when it comes to marriage, Solomon says this to his son, Proverbs 21, 19. He says, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome or nagging wife. Or Proverbs 27, 15, Solomon says, a quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. The idea being, yes, looks matter. Yes, chemistry matters. But make sure you use discernment when it comes to marriage. You're going to be with that person for a long time. And this word, this word quarrelsome, it carries the idea of someone who is always picking a fight. Someone who is constantly shaming, constantly scolding you. You see, Solomon, he warns his son, don't marry someone like this. Don't marry someone who is always criticizing you, always picking at you. Use discernment. On the flip side, he tells his son, Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. He says, when you are looking for a spouse, when you are looking at a relationship, you have to factor in more than what you see on the surface of someone's life. You have to look at the whole person. You have to use discernment. And the beauty is there are amazing people out there. There is someone who will bless your life. There is someone who will bring favor into your life. And the key is discernment. Now, women, you might be thinking, what about the flip side? Where are the Proverbs about husbands? Where are those? Well, Solomon was writing to his son. So most of the Proverbs talk about relationships, about what to look for in a wife. But I brought some Proverbs from the book of Andrew. For example, Better to live in Bakersfield alone than to date a guy who lives in his parents' house and plays video games all day. Can I get an amen to this one? Or here's another one. An emotionally stunted husband is like being stuck listening to someone chewing with their mouth open. Now, some of you women, you are dating a guy right now who is emotionally stunted and he chews with his mouth open. And I just got to tell you, that guy's got to go. Now, of course, neither of these are actually in the Bible, so you don't need to go look for them. But I believe all of us right now in this season of our life, we could use some time to strengthen our discernment muscles. So today, that's my hope for us. So I want to encourage you, if you're watching online or listening to our podcast, take a minute to grab something to take some notes because this week we are going to get so very practical. 
And we're gonna jump right in with three things, three things that we can all focus on that reveal the red flags. The first up is I wanna start with a definition though. Discernment is understanding. Former behavior predicts future action. You see, discernment is realizing if someone is willing to lie early in our relationships about little things, odds are, then they're gonna lie later on about big things. You see, discernment is understanding that if you interview someone for a job and in the past three years they've had seven different jobs, odds are they're not gonna magically change at your organization. You see, discernment is realizing if you are dating someone who talks about all their crazy exes, odds are one day very soon you'll be added to that list of crazy exes. Now, can people change? Of course. That's the whole reason we exist as a church. We believe in the power of God to do anything. And discernment is still understanding that former behavior predicts future action. So we're going to unpack these three areas that reveal the red flags in our lives. Three areas that we can start looking at today. First up, the words we hear. One of the most important things in life is to simply listen to what someone's saying. John Gottman, who is one of the leading experts in marriage, he can predict if a marriage is going to make it or end in divorce with 90% accuracy after he spends just 15 minutes with a couple. How does he do this? He just listens to the words they use around each other. Do they speak words of contempt? Are they critical or do they get defensive quickly? Proverbs 12, 18 says this. It says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords but the tongue of the wise brings healing. See, our words have so much power, but often we throw words around with no regard for other people. So when it comes to relationship, how do they speak to others? If you are on a date, how do they talk about their parents? How do they talk about their coworkers? How do they speak to the waiter or waitress? And this isn't just about dating. Uh, years ago, Melissa and I, we were newer to ministry, and we went out to dinner with this couple who were a little farther along and just a little bit older than us, and they offered to take us out to dinner. So we went to Applebee's, I know, fine dining, and within the first few minutes of getting there, this couple, they began complaining about the service, the wait time, they complained to our waitress, they complained to the manager about our waitress. I mean, it got so uncomfortable so quickly. Melissa and I, we were just sitting there and we're thinking the whole time to ourselves like, oh man, this like free chicken finger platter dinner, like it's not worth it because this couple, they would go from talking about faith and love and ministry to just vocally and just so loudly complaining because their water wasn't refilled fast enough or the food wasn't coming out fast enough. I mean, come on, it was Applebee's. We couldn't get out of that dinner fast enough because we saw the red flags all over the place. You see, the words people use, they tell us a lot. Now, one more thing when it comes to words. A big warning sign with words is sarcasm. Be careful of people who are very sarcastic. I love this verse from Proverbs 26. It says, like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death is one who deceives their neighbor and says, I was just joking. You see, there are some of us who are so good at saying something that carries a harsh, sarcastic edge that really cuts. And then the moment these words get us in trouble, we say, oh, I didn't mean it. I was just joking around. But let me just tell you right now that there are few things more toxic to a relationship than sarcasm. Sarcasm is like a person just shooting arrows all around that start fire and then just being like, oh, sorry, just kidding about that one. You see, discernment is evaluating all the words we hear from someone. But that's not all. Discernment is also evaluating the people they serve. You see, it's easy to serve people who will help us get ahead in life, isn't it? For example, if the CEO of your company calls you today and asks for help with a project, it honestly doesn't take a lot of character to drop everything to help because you know helping people who are above you, it gets you ahead in life. It's easy to serve someone if they have something you want money or power or influence, it's easy because in those moments, the person you are serving is yourself. You're doing it so you get ahead. But you see, discernment is looking at someone and seeing, are they the type of person who has a heart to serve others, even if there is no benefit to them? 
Let me give you an example of this. We have a staff of about 20 people at our church. So occasionally we'll have an open role and we'll start interviewing people for it. And one of the things I've learned to do is after all our interviews, I gather the interview team and we debrief the candidates. And one of the people I always get feedback from is our admin staff. And here's why. Because if I, as the lead pastor, if I ask a candidate to do something, to fill out a form or take an additional personality test or send an additional reference, people respond to me right away because I'm the lead pastor. But sometimes if one of our admin people will send an email or text asking them to do something, hey, you forgot to fill out blank, can you do that for us? Sometimes candidates, they won't respond or they'll respond with a little bit of rudeness to their tone. Uh, and they'll be just unkind to one of our admin staff. And what I found is it's those moments that really reveal someone's character and heart. You see, one of my favorite things to do around the crossing here is on weekends is if I'm not teaching, I love to just go and interact with people who serve. We have this amazing team of people that's growing every single week of people who choose to take time out of their every day, their Sundays, their weekends, sometimes during the week, to serve kids or students or serve the homeless in our community. We have people who show up early and stay late for teardown. We have people who serve in security, who keep our campus safe. We have people who greet people who are new. We have people who run audio or lights or cameras. I mean, we have a great team of people who love to serve. And often I'll go around and I'll thank these people. And the most common response I get from the people who serve around here is, it's the best part of my week. Because serving, it does something inside of us. It grows us. It changes us. And what I found, now I don't have any data to back this up, but what I found in my personal experience is the people who are most critical of others are the least likely to serve. Uh, I've shared with some of you over the last few years, uh, as my kids have started playing soccer here in Costa Mesa, that one of the deals is every family needs to volunteer. It's less about volunteering with this organization, more about being voluntold. But I've told some of you how I got roped into being a soccer ref for little kids. And you think this would be an easy job, right? Being a ref for kids for soccer. You'd think that parents would be pretty compassionate to a dad who's refing a group of eight-year-olds who are just learning, who is not professionally trained as a ref, who's just out there making sure kids can have fun and be safe, right? Wrong. What I found is the parents who are the craziest, the parents who scream at the kids and coaches and the poor refs like me the most from the sidelines are people who have never had to put on a ref shirt and volunteer to ref a game. The same is true in church. The people who are often most focused on what the church should be doing for them, the people who are often the most critical of the music or the messages or the campus or whatever else it is, are usually the people who have never stepped up and volunteered or served. Because you see, service, it does something inside of us. It increases compassion. It increases our kindness and understanding. You see, service reminds us that life, it's not all about us and what we can get out of life. Service reminds us that God put us on this planet for a reason to bless and impact others. In fact, it's Jesus who said, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, serving aligns us to the heart of God. So I'll tell you, it's a big red flag when people, they don't have a pattern of service in their life. Okay, last one. Three areas that reveal the red flags in us. First, the words we hear. Second, the people they serve. And then third, their primary passion. This final one is really now a culmination of the first two because we tend to talk about what we are honestly passionate about. We tend to serve what will move us towards our primary passion. Let me give you an example of this. If you were to follow me on social media, you'll see pretty quickly what I'm passionate about. 99% of what I post on Instagram will involve what God is doing at the crossing, or my family, or maybe running or sports. I mean, I hate to admit it, but I'm not that fun of an Instagram follow because I'm not going to post any hot takes on politics. I'm not going to post anything that is crazy controversial. Why? Because I'm just not passionate about those things. I'm passionate about what God is doing here. 
So often I'll post a story of God moving through someone's life in baptism, or I'll post about our amazing kids' ministry because I love how this place is building into my kids. I'll post about my family because I love my family. I think they're the best. I think about, I talk about, I read about the things that I am passionate about. The same is true for you and the people who are in your life. We talk about what we are passionate about. If you're passionate about clothes, you're going to talk about clothes. If you're passionate about working out, you're going to talk about the gym you go to. Now, we're going to dive deeper into this one in a couple of weeks, but I just want to throw this out here. If you are a passionate follower of Jesus, if your faith matters to you, if God is at work in your life, you're going to talk about it. And if you go on a date with someone and they never talk about their church, they never talk about what God is doing in their life, I just want you to know they aren't passionate about their faith. I mean, they could tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, I actually believe in God or I just can't find the right church yet if you ask them. But the reality is, if they aren't talking about their faith, it's because they probably aren't very passionate about it. You see, we can't fake passion. We can't change someone else's passion. Only God can do that. Now, again, we're going to hit on this in a couple more weeks, but I want to encourage you. Be looking at what people around you are passionate about. So this week, here's my hope. I want us in this season to continue to strengthen our discernment muscles because discernment is understanding. Former behavior predicts future action. And the better we understand the red flags around us, then the better we're going to be able to see the green flags in front of us. And let me just tell you from experience, when you meet someone who uses their words to bless others, when you meet people who are encouraging and kind and compassionate, when you meet people who go out of their way to serve people in need, who love people well, who aren't overly critical, but they have a heart of compassion, and when you meet people who are passionately pursuing the same things you are interested in, who are passionately pursuing Jesus, what you find is whatever type of relationship you're looking for, romantic, friendships, work relationships, what you find is God is in those relationships. What you experience is hope and grace and the life change that he offers. And that's my hope for you, and that's our hope for you as a church. Let's pray. So God, we come before you and we say thank you. God, I pray for every single one of us that in this season we would look with discernment at the relationships we're in. And we would identify, not just out there, but in here, the areas where we need to grow. And God, we want to say thank you today for being with us, for meeting us in this place. God, help us to develop life-altering friendships and relationships that honor you. We love you, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. <music>